Hello and welcome to Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro, coming straight to you today from a hotel room. Today's video is, in fact, on the Sega Pico. After joking about how weird this thing is for years now, I actually ended up with one of my own. This was all thanks to my friend G from G to the Next Level. Seriously, you rock, dude, and y'all should go subscribe to him because he directly made this video possible. I've also since gotten numerous requests to do a video on the Pico from viewers. Most notably, I've gotten a good few from longtime channel supporter 1UP John, who reminds me every few months that I did, in fact, promise to do this video. Anyways, you all may be asking, Jamie, why is your disembodied voice doing a video on the Sega Pico from a hotel room? After all, it's, at the time of making this video, the year 2020, and the world is playing on funky mode. I shouldn't be traveling anywhere. Well, in the process of working on this video, my house had some certain pipes related issues that made it uninhabitable for a few days, meaning that I got to take a bit of an unplanned holiday vacation to a little place called that hotel three blocks from my house. Oh well, at least I got to do some sort of traveling over the holidays. Though, I guess it's also a bit odd to end a year that began with a video inspired by Red Bard with one that's mildly inspired by the Tim Traveler. Bitching aside, what is the Sega Pico? While the Sega Pico was an edutainment-focused console released by Sega in 1993 in Japan and 1994 in North America. This was despite them also supporting multiple versions of the Sega Genesis, the Sega Game Gear, Sega CD, Sega 32X, and even preparing for the launch of the Sega Saturn in Japan at the time. To be fair to Sega though, this system wasn't aimed at a traditional gaming audience. Instead, they are aiming more towards young children. I think that's pretty clear thanks to its Japanese name, the Kids Computer Pico. At first glance, it appears just to be Sega's take on some sort of Fisher-Price toy. It's made of very sturdy feeling plastic that's presented in a shade of purple and turquoise that wouldn't feel out of place on the set of Barney the Dinosaur. Granted, I say sturdy like there isn't a chunk just missing from my unit. On first glance though, it really just appears to be some sort of unassuming kid's toy. That couldn't be farther from the truth. What I think really makes this thing stand out is the hardware. At first glance, sure, it seems super unimpressive. The internals are almost the exact same as in a Sega Genesis, with it taking the same power supply as a Genesis Model 2 even. Worse, it's limited to only composite output, and it's a fairly fuzzy composite out at that. I mean, to be fair, the system only cost 160 US dollars at launch, but even then, this seems like a bit of a lackluster presentation here. However, if we unhook this latch here, we'll see that the Pico folds out like a laptop. The controls are all built into the system, and there's no way to add any additional ones. There's a big red button and a split D-pad on the left side of the unit, all of which feels spongy and terrible. Next to that, though, is a massive pad and a stylus pen. This acts like a mix between traditional tablet stylus and a mouse. You can move a cursor around in most games just by moving the pen around the pad, but instead of using the buttons to click, you instead press down with the pen. This results in a really solid sounding physical clicking noise, and the pen itself is shockingly responsive and really comfortable to hold. Also, despite seeming hardwired, if there is ever an issue with a Pico's pen, you can just remove this little flap on the side of the unit using a screwdriver, which lets you get to those great wired internals, yum. Usually I'd be against having hardwired seeming controllers, but by having the pen wired up like this, it makes it near impossible for a young, toot-filled 90s gamer kid to lose it. And really, I think anyone who's been around small children can agree that's a plus. What also sets a Pico apart from pretty much any other game system ever is its cartridges. To insert a cart, you have to tilt it into the cartridge slot and push it back. Once it's in successfully, the system will emit a reassuring clicking noise. To remove it, you have to undo a physical latch to take it out. This makes this thing almost perfect for taking over to a friend's house with a cartridge in tow. Or, in my case, to a hotel. As you may have noticed, the cartridges here more so resemble storybooks than traditional game carts. Well, they are marketed by Sega as Storyware, and along with having multiple plasticky pages, they can be interacted with by using the pen. 
I'm not exactly sure how, but the game can tell every time you turn a page. By clicking the pen on different parts of each page, you can enter into new areas and interact with NPCs and do gamey things. I know this is tech that's over 25 years old, but I still find this to be somehow impressive. Here we have something that's managing to combine both books and video games into one thing. And it somehow all works, and it doesn't just work, but it works well. I think the one game that demonstrates how all of this comes together best is Sonic the Hedgehog's Game World. If only because it's the only Pico game I own. In this game, you play as Sonic, Tails, or Amy Rose, who as far as I can tell is appearing here in her first ever playable appearance, as they compete against Dr. Robotnik in a Sonic-themed carnival world. And really, that's basically it. Despite there being plenty of mini-games where you're basically attacking effigies of Robotnik, he's not actually up to anything nefarious here. Like, I know he's known for turning animals into robots and stuff, but I don't think he's actually doing anything like that here. Maybe it goes more in depth on this in the manual, which I don't have, but like goodness, imagine if Mario Party had a Barry Bowser Alive minigame, and you have the same level of no chill that Sonic's game world has. Also, this game has a lot of voice samples. All four main characters are voiced, and though they don't have a ton of lines, they sound great. It's a shame I can't find out who any of the voice actors are in this game, because everyone does a good job. These characters all also sound eerily similar to their modern incarnations, which I know can't be the case because this is a Sonic game from the 90s. Game World features no less than 13 different minigames, and they range from being pretty okay to being downright lame. The worst ones are the ones that require a lot of button mashing. Like, this big red button right here feels like it's resting on a bed of foam, and it just wasn't made with this type of stuff in mind. All the stuff that uses the pen, though, feels great. Seriously, this game shows off the pen's functionality just as well as Wii Sports showed off the Wiimote. It feels kind of like a tech demo in that way, sure, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. This one game managed to sell me both on the concept of storyware and the mouse pen. Perhaps best of all, though, is what you'll find on the last page of the Game World Storyware cart. Move on over, Mario Paint, because this Sonic game has a drawing program on it. And look, just because I have a fine arts degree, that doesn't mean I'm a decent artist. Anyways, for at least a couple of years now, the Sega Pico has been a butt of a good few jokes of mine. And now that I not only have one, but have spent time playing around with it, I think it's honestly really cool. I certainly would have especially loved this if I was still the intended age for it. But even as an adult, I think it's just plain fun. So, if the Sega Pico is so cool and all, that means it must have been a huge success for Sega. Right? Well, eh, kind of, sort of. In North America and Europe, the Sega Pico was a bit of a failure, just like the vast majority of hardware Sega released in the mid to late 90s. This was despite Sega of America president Tom Kalinske thinking the absolute world of this thing. But, for some reason, whether it be due to Sega having too many systems out on the market at once, or just this system not resonating well with North Americans, it just did not sell well over here. In Japan, on the other hand, the Sega Pico was massively popular. While the Pico was discontinued in 1998 over here, over there it lasted well into the new millennium. New Sega Pico systems were even made after the discontinuation of the Sega Dreamcast in 2001. To be fair, this was helped by it having a slew of licensed titles, many of which were Japan exclusive. Along with first party games based off the likes of Sonic the Hedgehog and Echo the Dolphin, the Pico also had games based off of Doraemon, Lego, and even Kamen Rider. And then in 2005, Sega released the Advanced Pico Bina. This console was a direct successor to the Pico, and came out exclusively in Japan. Oh, and it is officially Sega's last console. As much as I love the Dreamcast, it was beaten out by a system originally intended to teach math and reading. The Bina was clearly a bit of a hit as well, as Sega would release a light version of it in 2008. There would even be several Pokemon games released exclusively for the Bina. Edutainment or not, seeing games from a series I associate so closely with Nintendo appearing on a Sega system just blows my mind. So that's the story of the Sega Pico. 
It's weird. It's retro. It's appearing in this video right now, which was made possible in part by the patrons and channel members you see listed right here. It's an odd system, sure, but it's a neat one, and one that I really wish had seen more success over here. Despite its name, I guess you could say the Sega Pico was capable of some big things. And now, if you excuse me, 2020 has been one hell of a year, and I think I need to unwind a bit. I mean, I am at a hotel after all. So if you need me, I'm going to be stuffing my face with cheap pizza and lamenting the horrors humanity is capable of while playing Sonic and the Secret Rings.